wind up alarm. This is actually a sermon illustration. Um, but I will tell you this. It is going to be shorter than I sometimes go. And that's an illustration as well. Make sure that the clock doesn't run out while I'm preaching, because that would wreck the entire illustration. OK. Turn that where I want it. Um, have the time. Yep, the time is right. Set the time. Time is right. I have my, I'm just talking out loud here, thinking out loud. Okay, I got it all the way I need it. Okay. Now I want to see if this will pick up the ticking. I didn't, you can see I didn't practice this ahead of time. <laughs> so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to forget that. Okay. This is really working. I have you guys' attention. <laughs> like watching Pastor Bumble with his sermon illustration. Okay. Can you hear it ticking? Okay. It's not too loud, right? Not too annoying. Okay, just stop. Okay. <laughs> you can tell that I've never done this before. Psalm 90. And my goal is for the alarm to go off while I'm preaching. That's my goal. Now, I'm trying to get at least most of what I want to say on before the alarm. But my goal is for it to go off while I'm preaching so that you will get a picture in your mind of what I'm trying to say by this message. And that is the fact that none of us know when our life is over. None of us know when we're going to die. It is unpredictable. It is not sometime, a time that we know. And I want us to go home today with this thought in our mind that life is short and we do not know how much time that we have. And just like when this alarm goes off, my preaching time's up. In the same way, your preaching time's up and your life's over. Your service to God is up when your life is over. And you have a limited amount of time, and you do not know how much time you have. Just like you do not know what I set that alarm for. So you don't know when it's going to go off. I do, you don't. But for the sermon illustration, I'm keeping it turned so you can't see what time it was. Don't wreck it, come peek away. But this is actually not a game, and it's actually not a gimmick. Actually, that is the way life. And when that alarm goes off for you and your life is over, it will be a lot more drastic and life-changing than some of the alarm going on in the sermon. So this sermon is really not uh, an illustration that's being overly dramatic. In many ways, it's not dramatic enough. I want to ask you to, if you have Psalm, I keep saying, ask you to turn, ask you to turn. By now, you all will have found Psalm 90, even though you've never opened the Bible before to draw this delay. <laughs> psalm 90, and I'm going to read to you the whole psalm. Psalm 90 starting with verse 1. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are as asleep. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up, and in the evening it is cut down and withereth. 
For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and they fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may, may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long, and let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us, and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy work appear unto thy servants, and thy glory unto their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. I want to call your attention to verse 12. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Teach us to number our days. The title of the message, Teach Us to Number Our Days. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Father, I pray that the message today will be a message that we all remember. Father, I need to remember it too. That we would think about the brevity of life, the unpredictability of life. And Father, that we would take seriously our responsibility to number our days, to think about what we're doing and the choices that we make, and to re recognize and realize that we do not know how much time we have left. I pray, Father, that that would help us and motivate us to live for you and be right, to live each day as if it were our last, because quite frankly, it could be our last. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. July 2000, I came to work at Marvin Windows, Warwick, Minnesota. My wife and I had been married about three months. At our wedding, my wife had a friend who could play piano by ear, and um, I had gotten her to play all of the music that we had for our wedding because it wasn't written down, because I couldn't write music, and so she, I put it on a cassette tape, some of you remember what cassette tapes are, and she would go to college, her name was Kathy Watson, she would go to college and she would play the tape, listening to me playing the songs, and and she would practice and play. And the reason we had her play at our wedding is because she was the only one we knew who could just listen to the song and play it the way that I do. And obviously I couldn't play all the music at my own wedding. So that was how we worked it that this out. So we get together and practice some of the songs when she's back from college. And we got married April 22nd, um, 2000, 2000, not 2000, just 2000. And uh, then, um, you know, I think we saw her a couple times after that. And, uh, but anyway, I was working at Marvin Windows. I came in that day and I had been working. I think I'd been on break. I don't remember what time it was. But I came back to the line and uh, another lady that worked in the line said, Have you heard what happened? Um, there was a girl that was killed um, out on Highway 5. And I said, No, I didn't hear that. She, she said it was. Um, it, she was out rollerblading and she was hit by a car and and she said, um, do you know Mark Watson? I said, yeah. She said, it was, it was one of the Watson girls. Well, Mark Watson had six daughters. And I thought, I'm Kathy. And she said, it's Kathy. Kathy was 19 years old. She was saved. She loved the Lord. She had a boyfriend. Her boyfriend she had made a comment to her mother that she wanted to be a teenager for the rest of her life. She didn't want to stop being a teenager. She was 19 years old. Her birthday was just a few days away, her 20th birthday. Her, uh, she had a boyfriend who actually had bought a ring, an engagement ring that he was going to give her on her 
Tony's birthday, but she didn't know. It was in the evening. She was wearing dark clothing. She uh, decided to go out rollerblading on the road outside her house. So it's a main highway, but out in Oregon, so that's not very well traveled. Um, she was actually on her side of the, of the road and she saw other cars coming, but she thought she was okay because she was on her side at the last minute one of the cars decided to pass the other car. And that's how she knew him. And um, her mother told the story that when she walked out the door, I'm going rollerblading, mom and dad, see ya. That she just had this funny feeling when her mom, when her daughter left. And a few minutes later, the mom and the dad are both home. Dad was a preacher. A few minutes later, they heard the ambulance go by their house. And they both looked at each other without knowing anything. All they heard was ambulance. And they both said, they just looked at each other and said, Kathy. 19 years old. Um, lots of friends. Lots of plans for her life. A fiance, a, a boyfriend who wanted to marry her. Lots of talent, lots of skill. A very a person had a very wonderful personality. But her life ended unexpectedly, and that's what Moses is talking about in Psalm 90 when he says, "Teach us." To number our days. We do not know how long we have to live. And we do not know when we will die, none of us. We have no guarantee of tomorrow. Now in our culture, we try to ignore that. We try to forget about that. And we try not to think about the brevity of life. We try not to think about how quickly our lives can be over. But that's the wrong approach, especially as Christians. The Bible says, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. What that tells me is if we don't number our days, we will not apply our hearts unto wisdom. See, if we don't think about the brevity of life, we will not make wise choices. If we don't, if we take our life for granted, we will not make the choices we need to make a difference to, in God's kingdom the way we should. And so today we are going to talk about numbering our days. And that's why you can hear that little tick-tock, tick-tock. When you hear that tick-tock, I want you to think about your life. And the fact that you, not someone else, but your own life. And the fact that you do not know how long that you have to live. And the fact that you will answer to God someday for how you spend your life. For what you did with the time he gave you. You'll answer to God if you die at the age of 19, like Kathy. You'll answer to God if you die at the age of 90. You will answer to God for how you spent the time he gave you on this earth. And so this is a serious topic that we would think about the brevity of life, that we would number our days, that we would make choices that count for eternity, because none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. I want to make three statements about death. Number one, death is the end of all men. It's the end of all men. It's where we're all headed. We are all going to die. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 2 and verse 4 says this, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay to his heart. The Bible says it's better to go to the house of mourning than the house of feasting. It's better to go to a funeral than to go to a party preached a message at a funeral about this. The Bible says it's better to go to a funeral than go to a party. Really? But I like parties, Pastor. Yeah. But parties don't prepare you for eternity. But funerals will. Funerals will make you think about your own life and how long you have to live. And he says this, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. You know what the Bible says about you if you don't like to think about death? The Bible says that you're a fool. You know what the Bible says? If in your heart you're thinking about that, about how long you have to live, the Bible says then you're wise. Because a wise person will use their time wisely when they realize 
that their time is limited. A fool just ignores what they know is true and says, oh, I, I'm going to live long. You don't know that you're going to live long. You have no idea how you're going to live long. Death is the end of all men. Three statements about death. Number one, death is the end of all men. Number two, death is unavoidable. It's unavoidable, folks. Everybody that was alive 150 years ago is no longer with us. Death is unavoidable. And that's uh, teaching about that is found in Ecclesiastes 8, verse 8. There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit. You know that? Your spirit goes to be with God. Your spirit goes and leaves your body when you die, um, either heaven or hell. And you don't have power over the spirit to retain the spirit. Death is unavoidable. There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit. Neither hath he power in the day of death. And there is no discharge in that war. You don't get out of that. You don't get to get out of it. Death is unavoidable. Neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. So number one, death is the end of all men. Number two, death is unavoidable. Third statement about death. Number three, death is unexpected. This is where very often young people go wrong. Is as young people, young people think, well, I have a long life ahead of me. How do you know? You don't know that you have a long life ahead of you. Many, many young people die. Many children die. You do not know that you have a long life ahead of you. And you need to recognize, we all need to recognize this morning, that death is unexpected. Number one, death is the end of all men. Number two, death is unavoidable. Number three, death is unexpected. And that's found in Ecclesiastes 9, 10 through 12. Listen to this. This is talking about making a difference while you live. Listen. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. Now that's talking about the fact that your physical body, God gave you in this physical life, all you have is while you're alive. And when you die, your, your physical body will no longer function. If you are unsaved, you will go to a place called hell to await the great white throne judgment, and then you will go to the lake of fire. If you're saved, you trust Jesus as your Savior, and salvation is a free gift, you will go to heaven to be with the Lord, your spirit will be there, and then someday when the, at the rapture, you will get your new spiritual body, and you will live forever with God. You will reign in the millennium, and then you'll live in the new Jerusalem of God forever. Okay, so, but your life on this earth, your, the physical abilities that you have will be over when you die. And that's why it says, there's no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. And then listen to this. It says, I returned and saw under the sun. And listen to this, especially young people, listen to this. The race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. Death is unexpected. Time and chance happen to them all. For man also knoweth not his time. You don't know the time you're going to die. As the fishes that are taken in an evil net. Anybody here like to fish? Do you think when you threw that line in and you hooked that northern, whatever you hooked, do you think it knew that that was its last day and that was its last bite? No, it had no idea. If it knew, do you think it would have taken a bite? No. And so it says, as the fishes that are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men snared in evil time when it falleth suddenly upon. And that's what's going to happen when that, when that goes off. And I'm going to give Mr. Hansen uh, instructions ahead of time because I'm doing something different than I've done before. When that ringer goes off, I'm going to go walk over, I'm going to shut off the recording, I'm going to shut off the video, and you're going to come up and lead us in the final hymn. I'm not going to say another word. And the reason is because I want you to think about the fact that when death is over, it is done. And there's nothing left for you to do. Your work is over when death is finished. And we need to realize in our minds, hey, we don't have much time. Death is unexpected. Death is at the end of all men. Death is unavoidable. Death is unexpected. Three statements about death. Now, I'm going to make three statements about life. Number one, life is a vapor. Three statements I made about death, and I'll make three statements about life. Number one, life is a vapor. James 4, 13 through 15. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, you don't know, right? It's unexpected. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, listen to this, we shall live and do this or that. You know what's amazing to me? 
that what he's saying is you should say, well, if I'm alive next week, I'll go to work. What? Yeah. The Bible says wise men think about death. That's what a wise person does. A fool ignores death and acts like, I'm going to live forever. I don't care. I'll do whatever I want. A wise person thinks about the brevity of life. Think about death. It says you should say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Kimberly, you should say, if God's wills, I will live and go to Miracle Mountain Ranch. Aiden should say, if the Lord wills, I'll live, and next month I'll be alive, and I'll be at House Anderson Mountain. Cohen shall say, should say, where's Cohen? I can't see him. Okay, there he is. Cohen should say, if God wills, I'll live, and then I'll probably die of stage fright when I preach my first sermon. <laughs> 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 All right, I won't, probably won't live past that, but if the Lord wills, I'll live to that point. Okay? We should all say, if the Lord wills, We'll live and hang out in the Ferrer's backyard and eat some burgers. Hopefully they won't be burned, right? That's that's what we should be saying. The Lord wills, we'll live. This is oh, this is heavy stuff, Pastor. Hey, life's heavy. You ever been to a funeral? That person's dead. It's over, it's finished. And that's happening to all of us. And we might as well not get used to this idea. We might as well accept it. You know, we'll make wiser choices if we think about death. Instead of just parties and having a good time, we need to think about it. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying you can't have a good time, enjoy yourself, laugh. You know, I love to laugh and joke and have a good time. I'm not saying you can't have fun, do fun things. Pleasure is part of life. God wants you sometimes, you know, all work and don't, no play makes Jack a dull boy. Sometimes you need to relax. You just say, come apart and rest a while. I'm not saying, but I'm saying we need to be serious about our life and we make wise choices and we need to think about how we use our time. The Bible says, be careful. Um, and, uh, and number your days. All right, so number three statements about life. Number one, life is a vapor. Number two, life is about redeeming the time. Redeeming the time. Ephesians 5, 15 through 16. See then that you walk circumspectly. Christian message on school a while ago. Not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. I believe that saying days are evil in the sense that we're going to die soon. We need to redeem the time because the days are evil. So, life's about redeeming the time. And what that means is this. You have so many minutes in a day. And you need to think about how you're spending those minutes. Because if you knew you're going to die tomorrow, would you make a little different choice of how you spent your life, about how you spent your minutes today? I think you would. We all would. Now, I'm not saying you can't relax and have a good time. Maybe that's what you want to do is relax at the, at the lake with your family and then just enjoy being together before you die. That's fine. But what I'm telling you is this. Think about your life and what you're doing, and redeem the time. To redeem something is to buy it or to get it back. It's basically that you say, hey, this day, I've got 24 hours in this next day. I've got 12 hours, 14 hours of awake time during this next day, whatever time is your awake time. What am I going to do during that time? What am I going to do? Maybe you want to increase your awake time and decrease your sleep time. I mean, it wouldn't be a bad idea. I'm not saying you need sleep too, because for your health, I know. But I'm just trying to say, think about what you do and redeem the time. Young people, redeem the time. You could die at 19 like Kathy Watson. Redeem the time. I know of a young man, I believe his videos are still on YouTube, but he was going to be a professional baseball player. And he gave all that up at the age of 16. And he went to, and, and uh, he went into, in, into uh, different kinds of ministry and started really getting active in his church and soul winning and he created YouTube videos or, or videos I don't know if they, it was I don't know if YouTube was around at the time this is a little while ago but he created videos online and they were soul winning gospel videos and he and he went to Maranatha Bible College Aaron Hayden Anderson's name was some of you may be doing it and he and his grandparents and uh, and he died in a car accident when he was 20 years old and I just know that the Lord was putting that on his heart. If he had just spent all his time playing baseball and he had died in that same car accident, he would have been wasting his life because he would accomplish nothing for God. So he accomplished more in that short amount of time where he switched from baseball to soul winning. He accomplished a lot more. It was just packed out at his funeral. It impacted so many people's lives. He accomplished way more because of that. And I'm not saying that's what you need to do, but I am saying this. Redeem the time. You have a certain amount of time. It can be thrown away or it can be redeemed. You can take those hours, those minutes, those seconds, and use them for God. Redeem the time. So number one, life is a vapor. Three statements about life. Number two, life is about redeeming the time. And number three, this is important, life is about laying up treasure in heaven. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, 
for moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Life is about laying up treasure in heaven. Whatever you do that's eternal is treasure in heaven. Whatever you do that has an eternal effect is treasure in heaven. There are many, many different things you can do with your money, with your time, with your talents, with your choices. But anything you do that has eternal value, whether if it's something that furthers the kingdom of God, has eternal value, it will be treasure in heaven. So life is a vapor, life is about redeeming time, life is about laying out treasure in heaven. Three statements about death. Death is the end of all men, death is unavoidable, death is unexpected. Three statements about life. Life is a vapor, life is about redeeming the time, and life is about laying up treasure in heaven. All right. Now in Psalm 90, there are five responses of wisdom. So you see in verse 12, before verse 12, Moses is talking about the brevity of life. Moses is talking about sin. He's talking about the fact that God's curse is on this world because of sin, and that's why there's death. He's talking about the fact that God's wrath is on this world because of sin, and that's why there's death. And he's talking about the brevity of life. And then he has a conclusion in verse 12. He says, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. And then now when he asks God to number, teach us to number our days, then he says, he responds with that wisdom. And here's what he says. Verse 13, he says, Return, O Lord, how long? And let it repent thee concerning thy servants. Now here's the response of wisdom. There are five responses of wisdom. Once we learn wisdom about the brevity of life, then we need to have the proper response. How should we respond to this knowledge? Should we go home? Oh, I was really depressed today. Pastor Hunter told me I'm going to die soon. No, that's not the response. That's the reality. But the response shows whether or not we got wisdom from the reality. First was this, ask God to forgive your sins. That's the first response of wisdom. Ask God to forgive your sins. Return, O Lord, how long? And let it repent thee concerning thy servants. You see how Moses is saying, God, we've sinned, we've done wrong. But God, will you return and come and bless us? Let it repent thee concerning thy servants. He has an attitude of asking God to help him, asking for forgiveness. And I think that applies whether you've never asked Jesus to forgive your sins and you're not saved. Today will be a great day to ask Jesus to forgive your sins, put your trust in him. We're all sinners. Jesus Christ paid for our sins on the cross. All we have to do is receive that by faith, and we receive eternal life. The Bible says, even believe it on the Son with everlasting life. So that's appropriate. Is not the five response to wisdom. Okay, how should we respond? We found out that life is short. Now how do we respond? Number one, ask God to forgive your sins. If you've never been saved, ask Jesus Christ forgive your sins today. And if you are saved, but you really haven't been living for God, that might be a good start. It is a good start to say, God, will you forgive me? I've been living for you. Will you forgive me? I want to start doing right. I want to start redeeming the time and making my life count for you instead of just living for selfishness and to please myself. That's a good response. So the five responses of wisdom. There's five responses will show us that we're gaining wisdom from our study of the brevity of life. Number one, ask God to forgive your sins. And number two, ask God to satisfy you early in life. He says in verse 14, O oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Ask God to satisfy you early in life. Do you know that the younger you serve God, the more you accomplish for God. The younger you follow him, you will rejoice and be glad all your days. You serve God. So he said, oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all day, all our days. The second response of wisdom is ask God to satisfy you early in life. Early in life, young. You know the Bible says this. It says, remember thy creator in the days of thy youth. The younger you give yourself completely to God, the more you will have. You'll rejoice and be glad all your days. You will be living a life of purpose and meaning that will count for eternity. And you will get a reward of the judgment seat of Christ because you you sought satisfaction in God at a young age. So number one, ask God to forgive your sins, responses of wisdom. Number two, ask God to satisfy you early in life. Number three, ask God to help you make up for lost time. You know you can make up for lost time. There are people who get saved later in life and they accomplish more for God than people who grew up in that church and grew up being saved and were saved their whole life from their really young. They were saved, you know, some lived there. 
good church members, faithful, but they didn't accomplish that much for God. There are people who get saved later in life and they accomplish a great deal for God. There are people in a very, very short amount of time accomplish a lot more for God than people who live a long life. So ask God to help you make up for lost time. Why do I say that? Because in verse 15 it says, make us glad. Listen to this. This is interesting. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us and the years wherein we have seen evil. You know what he's saying? It's interesting there. He says, make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us. Okay, God, you were afflicting me before. In other words, I was, didn't have your blessing on my life. I was living for myself. I, didn't, I wasn't living and walking in satisfaction with God. I wasn't redeeming the time. But now, God, I've decided at this point in my life, whatever stage in your life you decide, you're going to serve God. Say, God, will you help me make up for lost time? I've lost. I've wasted. Like that song goes, I've wasted many precious years. Now I'm coming home. Say, God, will you make me glad according to the days you afflicted me? God, will you help me to make up for that lost time? And may I accomplish more now in this time to make up for the lost time? Ask God to help you make up for lost time. That's a response of wisdom, not a depression. Uh, I wasted my life. What's the point now? I might as well just keep on living in sin. No. You can make up for lost time. Ask God to help you make up for lost time. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us and the years wherein we have seen evil. Number four, ask God to do a great work in you and in the next generation. Since you have recognized that life is short, ask God to do a great work in you and in the next generation. He said, verse 16, he says, Let thy work appear unto thy servants and thy glory unto their children. Ask God to do a great work in your life and ask him to do a great work in the next generation. And he will. He will. Five responses of wisdom. Number one, ask God to forgive your sins. Number two, ask God to satisfy you early in life. And number three, if you're if you're changing your mind later on in life, ask God to help you make up for lost time. Number four, ask God to do a great work in you and in the next generation. Have faith that God can do a great work in your life and in the life of your the children in the next generation. And number five, ask God to establish the work of your hands. He says in verse 17, And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands established thou it. You know, when something is established, it means it lasts, it endures. And you know what Moses is saying? God, I want your beauty to be upon my life. And he's saying, God, I want other people to look and see you in my life. I want them to see the beauty of God upon me. But then he says, not only that, but the work that I do, I want you to establish it. You know, we're still talking and preaching about Moses today. I think God answers his prayer. God established the work of his hands. But you know, that's something we can ask for ourselves. Ask God to establish the work of your hands. Tell God, God, I don't want to do something that doesn't last. I want to do what lasts. Will you establish the work of my hands? Ask God to establish the work of your hands. What you're asking God is this. You're saying, God, the judgment seat of Christ. I don't want to have just your hands done. I want to have gold, silver, and precious stones. So God, will you establish the work of my hands? Will you give me the strength and the power and the ability and the wisdom and the insight to make wise choices with my life so that what I do counts for eternity? Not, not that people will notice in this life, but that God will say, well, none of good and faithful servant in that life. It's not about being famous. It's not about impressing people in this life. But it is about saying, God, I want you to reward me someday. I want the work of my hands to be established. I don't want it to be wasted. Gold, silver, and precious stones, that's some, a work that's established. Wood, hay, and stubble is a work that's wasted. Ask God to establish the work of your hands. Three statements about death. Death is the end of all men. Death is unavoidable. Death is unexpected. Three statements about life. Life is a vapor. Life is about redeeming a time. Life is about laying up treasure in hell. Five responses of wisdom. Now that we know these three statements about death, these three statements about life, what's the response? What's the wise response? Number one, ask God to forgive your sins. Number two, ask God to satisfy you early in life. Number three, ask God to help you make up for lost time. Number four, ask God to do a great work in your life and in the next generation. Number five, ask God to establish the work of your hands. Let the beauty of our Lord, the Lord our God, be upon us and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. When I was working in round tops at Marvel Windows, and I believe the year, the year this happened was 2002, I got to know a lady named Mary. And um, she was a very nice lady, and we worked together occasionally. 
but she most of the time worked in a different area than me, but I, I knew her. And one day, I came to work, and we were all working, and I looked over and I saw she had her jacket on, and it wasn't, it wasn't um, break time or time to leave. She had her jacket on, she was walking out the door, and her husband was leaving out the door, and she just had this stricken look on her face. And he had his jacket on, she had, he had obviously come to get her right in the middle of work, and he had escorted her out the door. And uh, found out later, her 16-year-old son had had an aneurysm in his sleep that night and died and never showed up for work at Dairy Queen. Folks, you don't know how long we have to live. The Bible says, teach us to number our days. Teach us to number our days. We need to live for what's right. Some of you who attended church here the first year I came down remember Jason Brennan. The Brennan family came to our church for a few months and Jason started to really dig into the Word of God. He was really just soaking up. He was growing. It was an encouragement to me. He was a real encouragement to me. And I was giving teaching. Um, I think around about June, he, I was giving some teachings on Bible translations. And he, one of the first things he did is like, man, he was staring at his Bible when I was done. I was giving some Sunday school lessons. And he was staring at his Bible. And, and I walked up and I was like, what do you, what, what do you, why are you looking at your Bible? He's like, man, we got to get a different Bible in than I be. <laughs> he was like, man, we got to get a different Bible. And I said, hey, and I just gave him a, a King James. And, and he was growing. And the family was growing. And just before um, I was going to take a trip up to northern Minnesota, I had a message about baptism that was also giving the gospel. And I was planning on preaching the message when I got back from my trip. And I don't know why. Well, I know why now, but I don't know why at the time I felt this way, but I just felt like at the last minute God wanted me to switch the message. And he wanted me to preach the message that I was going to preach after I got back from my trip, before my trip. And I didn't really understand it. I thought, well, Lord, it just seems like that's what you're leading me, so I'll do that. And uh, there, was a, there was a spiritual battle going on that morning. And by the way, the devil does this. He, he really gets a spiritual battle. So what ended up happening was um, I came to church, um, and I realized I had left my sermon notes at home. And so I almost switched my sermon at the last minute because I had left my sermon notes on. And then I suddenly remembered, well, wait, actually, yeah, I don't have the printed notes, but it's on my computer. So I opened my laptop, and I preached out of my laptop, which I normally don't do. And at the end of that message, I gave an invitation, and the whole Brennan family responded that they wanted, that they had trusted Jesus as Savior, and they wanted to be baptized. And that really encouraged me. I spent some time talking to them afterwards. We planned to do the baptism after I came back from the trip. And then we went on that trip. Jason Brennan was in a car accident. And if I had not given that message and gotten that response, I never would have known for sure that Rick Jason was in heaven, but I know he's in heaven. He gave testimony to quite a few people that he had trusted Christ as the same. 29 years old. Teach us to number our days. Some of you remember Josie Maria, nine years old, had cancer passed away a couple of years ago in Greensboro, nine years old, passed away. Teach us to number our days. Just recently, 11-year-old died, I drowned in the Wisconsin River. Teach us to number our days. Teach us to number our days. We don't know how long we're going to live. I don't know how long I'm going to preach. <laughs> I hear the TikTok. I haven't heard the ringer yet. I don't know how long I'm going to preach. Some of you are hoping it's soon. Some of you are okay with it being later. You're my favorites, by the way. Pastor's not supposed to have favorites. The pastor's favorites are always people who say, preach as long as you want. That's always the pastor's favorite. Sorry. I know I'm not supposed to have favorites. But I want you to think about your life. I don't know a lot of you here. And those of you that attend faithfully at Dallas Baptist Church, I don't know everything about you. You know I don't. But I do know this. The Bible says, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. The heart of fools is in the house of Martha. Think about your life. The choices that you're making along with your hand. God has a purpose for your life. There's a strange thing now. 
that um, we want to end our own lives, but we don't want to live the length God wants us to live. But we get angry when God takes someone else when their life is ended short. Isn't that strange when you think about it? As a pastor, I deal with this all the time. But people don't want to live anymore, and they're mad at God that someone else died. Wait, let me get this straight. You're mad that somebody else died and so you're going to kill yourself? I'm sorry, I'm having trouble understanding your logic here. You're mad that someone else's life ended so that you're going to end yours? Why? So you can make someone else mad that your life ended? I'm sorry, I'm being kind of blunt today. I guess I've been a pastor for a while. But you know what I see in that is rebellion. We want to be in control of everybody dies. We want to tell God how long our friends get to live. And then we want to tell God how long we get to live. And if we're tired of living, we want to end our own life. Folks, the Bible says teach us a number of our days. We don't get to decide how long we live. That's not God's design. It's not God's intention. God's design, God's intention, is for us to live our life for him. To number our days. To number our days. Teach us to number our days. Still on? <laughs> Another story, Big Vic. Those of you that were at, those of you that are at the youth conference, remember Abdel, Brother Abdel Judah preached the closing message at the First Baptist Hammond Youth Conference, and he told a story about a man that he worked with. I don't know how old he was at the time. This was about twenty years ago. I think the man was maybe in his fifties. I'm not sure. He worked with a man. They called him Big Vic. This man was big, this man was tough. And uh, he worked, it was a, some kind of factory place that they worked. And Big Vic took a liking to Abdel Judah. Brother Judah was in Bible college at the time. And um, they even had times where they would hang out together. Everybody had been praying for him. Brother uh, Judah had been praying for him, and he was waiting for an opportunity to share the gospel with him. Brother Judah had had a long day. And it was late at night, and he was ready to go home. Big Vic came in, and Brother Judah was punching out. And he said, hey, Abdel, why don't you come out with me and check the trailers at night before we close the trailers? Brother Judah was worn out. He was tired out. He'd had a long day. And he really felt like, yeah, God probably wants me to go out and check the trailers with him. And Brother Judah was tired, and he kept fighting it, kept fighting it. And he kept saying, come on out and check the trailers with me. And he was like, no, come on out and check the trailers. So what he ended up doing is, he said, no, i got to go home, I'm tired. He went home. As he was driving away, he felt the Holy Spirit tell him to go back. And he was like, no, I'm not too tired. I know I should, but I'm too tired. I'll go home. He went home. He went to bed that night. The next morning. Came to work. And on the top bunk, there was a sympathy card. Big Big had had a heart attack in the middle of the night. Big Big didn't know. Is that you today? Have you never trusted Jesus as your Savior? You're not ready? You need to know your days and ask Jesus to be your Savior. Is that you or are you the Abdel Judah? Is there someone in your life and you're not taking that seriously that you need to share the gospel with? Because you and I need to take our responsibility seriously. Teach us to number our days. Teach us to number our days. Young people, what are you doing with your life? When you get up in the morning, what are you doing? Are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? Are you sharing the gospel with people? Are you doing what God commands? Not so young people, what are you doing with your lives? What's the example you're setting? Are you busy in the work of the Lord? Are you raising your children to serve God? Are you working on your marriage? Teach us to number our days. Five responses of wisdom. Ask God to forgive your sins. Ask God to satisfy you early in life. Ask God to help you make up for lost time. Ask God to do a great work in you and the next generation. Ask God to establish the work of your hands. Life is short, folks. 
you don't know how long you have. The devil wants you to think that life is long, so you give up. But life is actually short. Teach us to number our days. And see, just like I was expecting the alarm to go off by now, and it hasn't, <laughs> death is unexpected. We don't know what's going to happen. But this is a, a very important time in our lives for each of us to think about what are we doing for God? What are we doing for his kingdom? Are we redeeming the time? Are we laying up treasure in heaven? Life is a vapor. Life is short. We don't know how long we have. This has never happened to me before. <laughs> but I'm trying to end my sermon and it won't end. Let me see what's going on here. <laughs> this is really fun. Now let me make sure the alarm's actually on. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha.